we're getting into like some serious drama here. On a parallel thread, I'd like met someone and they said, if you come through Germany, you stop by. And I said, okay, well, on my way to India, I'm going to stop by Daimler headquarters and, and talk to them and see if there's any kind of partnership that could be had. This is, I forget the exact, it's right before I gave the IAC talk. So that would be, that's how one could place it. And I met with their engineering team and I said, is there anything you guys, what do you guys want? Because I'm trying to play cool here, even though like we desperately need some kind of partnership or we're screwed. And, and they said, they're thinking about an electric smart car. So I was like, okay, if we were to do something, when, like, wh when would you want to see it? And I said, we've got like a delegation of Daimler executives coming through in January of 2009. And I think this was October or something like that. And I talked to JB and like Drew and Scott and Vineet and a bunch of others. I was like, guys, we need to get a smart car and we need to stuff a roadster powertrain into it and make a custom battery and it needs to work by the, by the time the Daimler team comes here in January. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my. We can interview JB and about it. And maybe he could add some additional color. So now, so the problem was that there were no smart cars in, were not being sold in the US, but they were being sold in Mexico. So we sent someone to Mexico to just buy a smart car and drive across the border. So we just, we, so we, this is a gasoline smart car. So we, with Mexican plates, so we went and bought a smart car in Mexico, drove it across the border, and then literally put a roadster drive unit and modified battery pack in in the smart car and had it working by January when the Daimler delegation came by. And I remember that being in that Daimler meeting and man, they were just, they were like, why? clearly they were quite grumpy that they even had to meet with us. They did not know we had this uh -oh. electric smart car. So they're grumpy that they had to meet with us and were clearly trying to get out of the room as quickly as possible. Yeah. And when we, we started off, made the mistake of starting off with PowerPoint, and the, which immediately made them even grumpier because <laughs> everything works in PowerPoint and they've seen way too many PowerPoint slides. And they were like literally getting ready to, they were going to just walk out from the PowerPoint presentation. I said, well, would you like to drive the car? What do you mean? So we have an electric smart car. So you want to drive it? Like, you don't have an electric smart car. That's impossible. I'm like, yeah, it's just in the parking lot. You can go drive it. Actually, it, it, it was a, not only was it was a smart car, it was fucking sick. This <laughs> thing had a roadster powertrain in a smart car. The power to weight ratio of this thing was bananas. It's like you could pull wheelies in a smart car. Literally, if could you step fly? <laughs> Yeah, you could lift the front wheels off the, <laughs> the deck. Motorcycle torque on a four-wheel vehicle. Yeah, motorcycle torque on a four-wheel vehicle. It was insane. You could burn rubber in a smart car. It looked bizarre. Like, yeah. you've just never seen a thing move like that. I might actually drive a smart car if it was like yeah, that. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> Anyway, so we just blew their minds. They're like, what? How is this? This is impo what impossible black magic have you figured out to have an electric smart car? So we got one from Mexico three months ago and we put a roadster powertrain in it and a modified battery pack. And you can still use the car, like the, inter in the interior of the car was still fully usable. So we didn't like intrude on the interior space. And we're like, yeah, we can. And they're like, okay, this is pretty impressive. They've never seen anything like this before. So then they're like, okay, they'll consider, they will do a, some smart car limited production. Like part of this is because they, they had to make the regulators happy. So this was not like, but they needed like some sustainable energy cars to make the regulators happy. This was, the, that was the reason for this electric smart car. The, fuel, the fleet miles. It was, not, it was not a grand vision by Daimler to go electric. No. It was to get these annoying regulators off our back. So for the so, credits, right? Yeah, there, there was like yeah. compliance vehicles. So it's like there was like a minimum number of electric vehicles that had to be made. They could also make fuel cell vehicles, but those were way more expensive. <laughs> yeah. So from this standpoint, it was at the time, it was really more what's the least amount of money we can spend and get the regulators off our, the re regulator monkey off our back. <laughs> that, that, so just, anyway, so that so, so we ended up making a bunch of electric smart cars for Daimler. And then over time, we actually ex ex extended that into an, like an electric. But they were always just really compliance vehicles. They did not want to make, Daimler was not willing to place at that time a big bet on electric vehicles. And, and so the volume and the price were always like, the volume's too low, the price is too high. This is, these are going to be niche vehicles no matter what. And, but anyway, so w what it did lead to, which was really essential, was Tesla getting saved by Daimler investing $50 million. So the $40 million invested in December of 2008 just gave us six months of runway. That basically gave us until June of 2009. And again, during this period, <laughs> General Motors is bankrupt, Chrysler is bankrupt. So not a lot of people are interested in investing in a startup car company, <laughs> let alone an electric car company. Yeah. And remember, this is back when electric was synonymous with dumb. You could just say, yeah. instead of using the word electric car company, you could just substitute dumb. Do you want to invest in a dumb car company? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what it sounded like to most people. And so at the time, the I think like Daimler was, I think Daimler vaguely thought that the Volkswagen Group might invest in Tesla, 
and they didn't want that. So they were essentially to block VW from investing in Tesla, which by the way, VW was not going to invest in Tesla. I talked to their person and they expressed some initial interest, but then they went dark on me. Only the only one, the only in- investor that was interested in Tesla at all was Daimler. Mm-hmm. And that was because of the electric smart program. Wow. So they invested $50 million into Tesla at roughly a $500 million valuation. So it worked out. Yeah, you know, 10% really. or something like that, yeah. Yeah, they got 10% of the company. Yeah. I mean, we're really, in, we're really in, the, in, in the weeds here, so hopefully this is interesting to some people. But this, this is like definitely some deep lore war story stuff. But in 2009, we're also just figuring out how to actually get the roadster into volume production. Yeah. So we were not able to reach volume production, for, even for the, by roadster standards, in 2008. And we still had a bunch of things in the car that were broke. I think we managed to deliver like maybe 20 or 25 cars in 2008, most of which were in December. And then... We had to bring all of those cars back to have refla- to have their drivetrains replaced, <laughs> and I think most of them got their battery pack replaced too. It was just a fumbling mess, basically. It was insane. But in two thousand nine, this is when we actually figured out how to make the car half decent, a half decent roadster one, where you could give it to someone and it wouldn't just break down immediately. And like a roughly summer of two thousand nine is when the car wasn't a complete piece of trash. That that just didn't work. <laughs> And then we did a Roadster 1.5, and then Franz joined, and Franz helped redesign the Roadster and make it better, the Roadster 2. Then by basically late 2009, early 2010, was where the Roadster was like decent as a toy. Yeah. Not as like a, a transport you could count on, but as a toy. It was decent, became decent around end of 2009, early 2010. Anyway, so that, that Daimler investment in May 2009 was what was essential to Tesla's survival. Not government loans. So this is another thing that is a misunderstanding here. Because what they got confused between, because GM and Chrysler and Ford, GM got a massive bailout, just like a flat out freaking donation from taxpayers of tens of billions of dollars. GM got a $30 billion handout, basically with no repayment. Last I checked, there's over $14 billion that's unpaid. Okay, so maybe it's a real amount though. Okay, so 14 uh, has not been repaid and, and never will be, I suspect. And then Chrysler got a bunch of money and then and then Ford Ford got like a $5 billion loan. But Ford is in better financial shape because, I don't know, for whatever reason, I think that Ford just, the Ford family has more long-term thinking than the people that were running GM and Chrysler. So they were in a, a better financial position. But it remains the case today that the only company, American car companies that have not gone bankrupt are Tesla and Ford. And unless something changes significantly with Rivian and Lucid, they will both go bankrupt. They're tracking to bankruptcy. They may not say that is currently, like if this were an airplane, they're like, they're going like that. So if something happens to go, it's change. (laughs) Okay, but currently they're at intersection with doom. I hope they are able to do something, but unless they cut their costs dramatically, they are in deep trouble. And we'll end up in the, in the cemetery like every other car company, with the exception of Tesla and Ford. Anyway, that diamond investment was essential to Tesla's survival. Around that time, in mid-2009, we got a letter, a, sort of a, a letter of interest, like a non-binding letter of interest from the DOE for a loan that I believe was around $500 million. Now, that was not a loan where they just give you $500 million. That was one where you spend the money you provide invoices, those invoices are provided to DOE, they then refund you based on the audited expenses that you paid. It's not lump sum type of thing, it's retro. It's retroactive after you spend it. It's a reimbursement program. It's a reimbursement, it's a loan reimbursement. So not, it's, there's nothing's given for free. <laughs> It's a loan reimbursement, so it's not. It, it would not be possible to use that as advanced capital to get make something happen. It can only be used to reimburse you, re- reimburse expenses that have already taken place with yep. a two to three month lag. And the first disperse that that letter of interest did not become an actual binding document until 2010. And then, and the first money that Tesla received as a reimbursement from that, I think, was March or April of 2010, by which time the recession had passed. So if we had needed the money from that loan, Tesla would have gone bankrupt. Yeah. So the DOE loan, I think, was helpful as an accelerant, but it was not a life or death thing for Tesla. And ultimately, the we, we, the, the constraints, the problem is that the DOE was second guessing our business plan and our execution. So there, so we're like, we need to change the business plan because if we keep going in that direction, we're gonna die. So we're gonna go in that direction and in the non-death direction. And then you're explaining to someone at the DOE why you're changing the plan. And then they're like, 
But the plan is different. You need to stay the plan. Well, if we stay the plan, we're going to crash and uh, the company will die. And that's why we want to change the plan. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the plan. <laughs> but that's the plan. And I'm like, okay, this is not good. But with enough effort, we could actually get the DOE to agree to change the plan. But this was taking up a lot of bandwidth to, to be constantly ex convincing people at DOE that the new plan is better than the old plan. So after the IPO in 2010, we paid back the DOE loan. That's awesome. And we actually had to pay a penalty, an early, there was an early repayment penalty. So we paid back the loan with interest plus a prepayment penalty. Hmm. Like taxpayers made money on the loan. Very important. Yeah. We made money on the Tesla DOE loan, whereas they're still $14 down on, on $14 billion down on, on GM. Another thing worth pointing out is none of the incentives, the EV incentives that exist, not one of them was obtained by Tesla. Not one of them. The $7,500 tax credit was General Motors. They're the one who got that. Like Tesla had no lobbying power in DC at all. Like the, but GM had huge lobbying powers. They're the ones that got the $7,500 tax credit put in place and Nissan. But we had basically no presence in DC. Because yeah, you'll suddenly hear, oh, Tesla's, Tesla and tax credits. I'm like, okay, currently we don't have, the $7,500 tax credit does not apply to Tesla, but it does apply to our competitors. So anyone who has not made, any company that's accumulated production below 200,000 cars has a $7,500 tax credit and Tesla does not because we've long ago exceeded the 200,000 car maximum. We t Tesla is at a competitive disadvantage with respect to tax credits. That is yeah. quite significant when you're talking about, say, a $40,000 car and a $7,500 tax credit. That's like a, almost a 20% difference. So a big deal. So Tesla is successful currently in spite of our competitors having materially greater tax advantages than Tesla. In spite of it, not because of it. If you eliminated all EV incentives tomorrow, Tesla's competitive position would improve significantly. I'll say that again. If you eliminated all tax credits in EV tax credits, Tesla's position would improve immediately. And Tesla did the purpose what the tax credits were for, right? To drive that innovation ramp. You guys just actually did it so fast that the competitors are still using yeah. it. When we started Tesla, gas was two, under two bucks a gallon in California and there were no tax credits. So it was not from the standpoint of, hey, this is a, a great opportunity. When we started Tesla, I should be clear, like, the, with, it was with an expectation of success of less than 10%. And the same for SpaceX. Yeah. And who in their right mind would think a car company would have anything more than a 10% probability of success if you've never done, built a car in your entire life before? And <laughs> the there have been. guys. Yeah, there's only. There's, exactly. There's only, at the time, you had GM, Ford, and Chrysler. And, but the history of car companies is like, there have been like over a thousand car company startups in the United States, and they're all dead with the 2008 2009 recession. GM and Chrysler also went bankrupt. So then the chances of survival are extremely tiny. Like only a fool would start a car company with electric car company or a car company whatsoever and think that the probability of success was high. So my initial thought for both Tesla and SpaceX was that I'd take half the money from the pay from PayPal and I'd waste half of it on two ludicrous ventures, one being a car company and a rocket company. And that would be dumb and I'd just lose it all and that'd be, but I'd still have $90 million left, so whatever. And but in the end, I could, I, like I so said, the companies were like children to me. So I was like, so I gave the companies all the money that I had. And then I would have had no money at all if Tesla and, and SpaceX had, had, had not survived. I would have owed a lot of money and been personally bankrupt if Tesla and SpaceX had not survived. That hadn't happened, we still wouldn't have electric vehicles. Yeah, not like I think so. I, it, like Tesla's, if, what is Tesla's fundamental value? It is to serve as an accelerant to sustainable energy. And if you said, but for Tesla, what would the world be like? In, in, in ways that, let's say you're, you're looking at this from the macroeconomic God standpoint, or like a civilization or the Sims or something. Like, what's the difference here? The difference b between Tesla and not Tesla is, by, is how many years is sustainable energy accelerated? That is the fundamental good of Tesla. Yep. Yeah. And then there's also the autonomy thing, which is, I think could also be very significant, will be very significant. But I'd say like in the absence of there being a fundamental technology discontinuity in the form of electrification and autonomy, both of them together, I think a new car company cannot succeed. So and I'll tell you, like, actually, the real reason that people should have been shorting Tesla, and perhaps why some of them were shorting Tesla, and the real reason that car companies, new car companies, cannot succeed, why it's very hard for them to succeed. And this was first told to me by this automotive investor when I was at Axel Springer headquarters getting a Golden Steering Wheel Award. And this guy, is, who's apparently like the best automotive investor in the world, comes up to me and he's like, Hi, I know why you're going to fail. I'm like, Please tell me. I can think of several reasons. <laughs> Tell me when I don't but, know. <laughs> yes. And he said, the, he said, the car companies don't make any money 
on the new car sales. They make all of their money selling use, uh, selling parts to cars to the existing fleet. So when the warranty runs out, like the life of a car before it hits the junkyard might be 20 years. The warranty is going to typically run out after four years, and there's a bunch of stuff that's not covered under warranty. So if you've got a steady state fleet, it means that 80% of your fleet is not under warranty. So you can sell high margin parts, replacement parts for the existing fleet. Mm -hmm. And you can sell your new cars at effectively zero zero margin. It's like a, it's like a razors and blades thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you sell the razor for zero margin yep. and you sell the blades at high margin. Mm -hmm. So then this creates a, an, a massive barrier to entry for any new car company because you have no existing fleet. So the only way for a new car company to succeed is, is that does not have an existing fleet is to charge a lot more for your car than what others are paying, than competitors. And in order to charge a lot more to have people actually buy it, the product must be so compelling that people are willing to pay the premium above the alternative cars mm -hmm. from the incumbent car makers. This is the only way. And I think without both electrification and autonomy, this does not succeed. So that is the only way to do it. You have to win on autonomy, and you have to win on electrification, and you have to make the product so compelling that, that it is worth paying the, the premium relative to the, the incumbent competitors. This is, this is a very big deal. Yeah. Very big deal. So, yeah. Why am exactly that customer, by the way? What, I, drove, I first drove, test drove a Tesla in 2015. <clears throat> the acceleration and all that was cool. The electric was cool. But when I tapped the stick for Autopilot 1.0 and it locked on the rail, yep. on the road yep. like rails, I went, holy shit, the future is here. And went from a $4,000 car to, at the time, a fully loaded Model S, opposite end of the spectrum. That exact angle was it. And that's gotten so many people mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. No oh, Autopilot, I, would have been, I probably still wouldn't be a Tesla car. Yeah. Why exactly. Think... It, it, the thing that actually got me, because we've got to get a lot of flack for like autopilot deaths and stuff. Yeah. But let me tell you that, <laughs> yeah, so no amount of statistics can convince people otherwise. They're like, I don't know. time. <laughs> yeah. But the thing that, that actually got me to really get a move on with autopilot was that this anecdote illustrates several things, by the way. And I think this was, this might have been like 2014 or something like that. A Model S owner in the Bay Area fell asleep while driving his Model S and ran over a cyclist and killed the cyclist. Now, if there had been even basic lane following, that cyclist would still be alive. So I was like, man, if anything illustrates the importance of autopilot, it's this case here where that innocent cyclist would still be alive if that guy that fell asleep had autopilot or any kind of lane following, even basic lane following, it wouldn't, the car would not have veered off the road and killed the cyclist. Mm -hmm. So I was like, we got to get a move on here. This is a real safety issue. So that's part of what really we need to go make this happen as, as quickly as possible but there's more to the story the guy that ran over the cyclist did not internalize responsibility for himself he said that the problem was he blamed it on tesla and said he fell asleep because of the new car smell <laughs> awesome. i'm not making this up you can literally search the court records and he got a lawyer okay amazingly got a lawyer to represent him the car and smells. file a lawsuit against tesla <laughs> saying it's not his fault he ran over the cyclist it's because of the new car smell that put him to sleep. <laughs> now, obviously, when this got before the judges, that's ridiculous, case dismissed. But this just gives you some sense of both the importance of autopilot and generally people's unwillingness to internalize responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> car smells. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He actually had the nerve to, to engage a lawyer and file a lawsuit. And you're like, wow, it's in the court records. Yeah. And you're like, oh, yeah, dude. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's you. Um, the judge like, it's you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Take responsibility for your actions. So, anyway. But the, yeah, so that's why I think some new car company is able to solve autonomy and electrification and make a product that's extremely compelling and reach volume production where with the cost of goods, where the cost of the car is low enough that you can charge a price where you don't exceed the affordability limit of people. The, the number of times I've had this conversation with like rich investors on in Wall Street is crazy because there, there are two factors at play. One is value from the other is fundamental affordability. So by these things are often conflated by, by if somebody has, is, has tens of millions of dollars, lives in Wall Street and, and whatever, they don't understand that, that they just think about value for money. They don't think about affordability. Like all cars are affordable. If someone just literally does not have enough money in the bank account, they cannot buy the car, even if you rail desirability to infinite. We'll just turn the desirability. This is the, this thing will transform into a jet and fly you to a private island. 
that it will create by itself. You can make it so desirable that it's, you can just make desirability infinite, but if it costs more than people can afford, they can't buy it no matter how great it is. And so that affordability threshold is very important. So it must both be good value for money and be affordable with, in order to achieve the, the unit volumes. And where car companies can get painted into a corner, the corner of doom, is if the, if the cost of the car is, is so high that they have to raise the price of the car to the point where the price of the car is, and Rivian I think has this problem, so, you know, that they either need to fix it or they're in deep trouble. They raise the price to the point where only a very small number of people can afford the car, no matter how desirable it is. Then at that point, if you cannot achieve a unit volume that covers your fixed costs, you're screwed. And I, Rivian needs, in my advice to Rivian too, would be to cut costs immediately across the board dramatically or they're doomed. Yeah. Or this applies to any car company. Really. Yeah. As you raise the price, sort of the percentage of people who can afford the car starts to drop exponentially. So you start getting a car above hundred thousand dollars, very few people can afford it, no matter how desirable it is. And then you've got to, but you've got to have enough unit volume to pay for to pay for your fixed overheads. So you basically you've got to you cover you've got to cover your operating expenses. Just check, see if I. We can do a time check too if we need to. No, I'm just a friend of mine is like suggesting that I troll hard drive by posting more memes from them. <laughs> They're just going to keep stealing their memes and posting them without giving them any credit. <laughs> People love that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the whole point of a meme. Exactly. Yeah. And typically, you like the meme too that you'll post, and so people know where it's coming from. It's belonging to people. Yeah. <laughs> so that's. You create your own memes, though, don't you? So I can create some memes. So your meme king is strong. Thank you. Yeah. Who controls uh -huh. memes? <laughs> control oh, my memes. friend is saying I should post hard drive memes and declare that I made it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I made it myself. <laughs> and then tell hard drive to stop copying me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Maybe one day I don't know AI will figure out how to copy them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might be scary. Be so vexed. Yeah. You good on time too? Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. This I was just getting little text buzzes. So but the, nothing is like the house something's on fire, which by the way, so, sometimes I do get the text. <laughs> house is on fire. <laughs> the, the house is on fire, the car is on fire, the dumpster's on fire. Oh, yeah. Remember, remember, we've, we've had a lot of dumpster fires at Tesla, actually. I've heard, what's going on in Fremont? It seems like a lot of I've fires heard, there. Fremont, yeah, my friends there keep texting me every time, but there's a dumpster yeah. fire. There Literal there. dumpster yeah. fire. It's like yeah. not a yeah. metaphorical dumpster, dumpster fire, it's literally a <laughs> dumpster <laughs> on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine the, you see the beam of the dumpster on fire floating down the river. In the, yeah. <laughs> in Things like if you have a lot of cardboard and wood packaging dumpster, then or whatever, it's going to, like if it's flammable, it's, or then somebody, I don't know, sometimes I think some of these things are some kids having fun or whatever, just being arsonists, and some of it are just, I don't know where, how these things, like, trying to figure out, like, why is this dumpster on fire? I, I don't know. It's on fire, clearly, but why did how the fire start? I don't know. Nobody knows how the fire started. They're like, dumpster fires are actually not that dangerous, but they're like, unless it's indoors or something, but like an, out, an outdoor dumpster fire is not intrinsically dangerous. It's contained. Yeah. It's contained. It's like, it's, the dumpster's not going to melt or anything. Yeah. So it tends to just be like, it just generates, it creates drama, but it's not like actually dangerous. So currently we get to give, we've all been FSC beta, you guys. Thank you, by the way. It's been fun. Yeah, thank you. Testing that. You got kicked out, but. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm low, long, 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 really long road trips. I just made, it's yeah. Been, it's I was on really, a long drive to San Francisco, really and unfortunately. Long, on really long road trips, I have this problem where I'll get the nag thing will give me enough times and I'll disable and 800 miles across Texas and I'll get tired of it. That's actually not what it's about. We currently get to give feedback for when the car does something wrong. Would it be useful if we got to give feedback when the car did something like really well and really right? Because I have to do great things all the time, but I have no yeah. way to call somebody or mark the video and yeah. say, hey, they did this turn incredibly. And great it's question. Because I'm assuming the AI is being treated, trained with reinforcement learning as well. It'd be great if we could help give that feedback when the car's like, great job, buddy, like the plus one button or something. I don't know. All input is error. Yeah, all input is error, exactly. Unless somebody yeah. missed the future, in which case, no input is error. Like in some cases, we've got like cool features nobody ever used or knew was there, like the Wizards in Winter Dance with the Model X doors. It's rare to encounter a customer who actually knows about that. 
most of them know it doesn't don't know it exists. Right. And then we made it like too hard to do. And it should be the opposite of an Easter egg. It should be like mac this maximized number of people who know about it, not minimize it. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, great. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think like people didn't translate that to my car can also do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. But uh, still today, I bet the mo probably I don't know, mo at least two thirds of Model X owners have no idea the car can do that. You're not uh, talking about the Christmas dance, are you? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah that's like such yeah. A, okay. Yeah. yeah. So obvious to you, but you know, yeah. It's like I've done it so many times. My neighbors have to move. Like, great. <laughs> you know, people have never seen a car do anything like that. No, it's uh, radical. Yeah. 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 Do you have a favorite Easter egg or feature that you've put into the cars that? Yeah, is this just your favorite? I suppose that the sort of Wizards, Wizards and Winter door dance is yeah. my favorite Easter eggy feature or yeah, fun awesome. thing that has no value in and of itself <laughs> of course except it does. entertainment. Yeah, it's like it's, enter to it. <laughs> it's entertainment, but it's it's not it's like an unnecessary thing that's cool. There was the t tap autopilot four times to play oh, more yeah. cowbell. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and then, like people would get, key. but now that's the one that you could accidentally do. And then and then it would, and then your screen turns to Mario Kart <laughs> yes. Rainbow Road. Yes. Yep. and. Uh, you can't turn the volume. Yeah. Kids can't be sleeping during that time. <laughs> yeah. Santa yeah. Shoes. Santa I think it's a few, uh, quite a few times people accidentally because it is a thing you could just tap too many times. Yep, it's, right. it's not one of those Easter eggs. It's like one of those like old, old school arcade games where it's like up, up, down, left, left. It's just press it four times and bingo. So I think a lot of people just <laughs> accidentally. What happened? <laughs> Am I going crazy? Why is the car doing this? <laughs> My grandma uh, lost it. Yeah, so that that's a cool one. You, know, you can change the car to enter 42, car's name changed to Life the Universe and everything. There's the James Bond, where it turns into the Spy Love Me car, the submarine car, basically. Yeah, yep. Is there any undiscovered yeah. Easter eggs? Personal phone and it changes to Thomas Edison. Is that my right? Maybe, actually. I'm not, there's a... Ha ha ha, if you want to change the screen for, to reindeer. Ha ha, not funny. We'll play the song Grandma Got Run Over with Reindeer. <laughs> Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer is the ha ha, not funny. Yes. <laughs> is there yeah. any undiscovered Easter eggs in production right now? There might be. Like, I, don't, they don't, they don't necessarily tell me about all the eggs. But the thing is that like, we, we can't spend too much time on Easter eggs because we should be. <laughs> uh, Come on, that should be the. the Entire focus. Probably, if something is rare, like what you're really trying to do is maximize the area under the curve of yep. number of people times degree of enjoyment. Yeah. So it's fine to have like a, a low effort Easter egg that is something that like a small number of people will get a lot of joy from, and then you like area under the curve of like a lot of joy, and it's, but it's a small number of people. Mm -hmm. but the, what you're really looking for is something that would provide a lot of people enjoyment and the area under the curve of total people times amount of an average enjoyment. Yeah. That's, the, that's what you're actually trying to do. So that's why you can't get carried away with the Easter egg stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you really want everyone to experience it, not make it some extremely 0.01% of people actually even know it exists situation. Yeah. I think we've got a lot of work to do actually with the basic software in the car, like our web browser sucks. And uh, we, we definitely need to do work on the overall interface in the car. There's yeah. a lot of complaints on the interface. I think yeah. we do better on the interface. But if you try to use the web browser in the car, it like takes a long time to load. It's a trash browser. Yeah. It's worse than like some iPad from five years ago, like by a lot. And like the, the rear screen and the SNX, the controls need a lot of work. But they, it can be quite helpful for entertaining your yeah. like ha having like your kids now have something to watch in the back. Yeah. yeah. And you can put like YouTube stuff Game on. Changer. It's a game, yeah, if you play that, it's a game changer. <laughs> it is a game changer. <laughs> but like, for example, like that's something where we could, we, we should have separate audio for the back. And yeah. like, yeah. Is, what's the point of, like currently we play the same audio level for the for that back screen in the mm -hmm. front as in the back. Yeah. Like it should just play, the back should play that audio. Or it should like route to a Bluetooth that's keyed off of yep. the rear screen. And then you give them headphones or something. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so that people can listen to music in the front and not get blasted by yeah. the YouTube kids show audio in the front, which exactly. is currently the situation. That's correct. So there's like a bunch of stuff like that, that we need to fix, but the, but the overwhelming focus is solving full self-driving. Yeah. Well, and that's essential. And like, that's really the difference between Tesla being worth a lot of money and being worth basically zero. Yeah. Yeah. One question I was going to ask with the little maybe a, line, a remaining time would do you, is there any additional questions or fud or misinformation about tesla or i don't know maybe you want to walk around the factory or whatever you have time for 
quiet, but whatever you have time for, we're game for. Is there anything we should go over that would be helpful? I think some of these things are like just like the whole founder thing is. Yeah. It's, it's I think fundamentally like even a sort like a stupid question because what does it mean to found something? Yeah. The, there's some critical mass of inspiration and perspiration, but it's a ne it's an, a nebulous number or, so, or it's a ne nebulous metric to say this person deserves to be a co-founder, this one doesn't. It's nebulous. But I think if you could apply the but for question, but for this person, would the company exist? Would it have gone bankrupt or not exist in a, in the form that it is currently, or in a much diminished form or simply not exist at all? And the only two people that you could apply the but for argument to are J.B. Stravel and me. But for J.B. Stravel and me, Tesla would, I would, I think, never have existed in any meaningful way. And if it had, it would have gone bankrupt. So that's those are the only two people that the before argument applies. Maybe you want to go into this here or not. You mentioned, I think, out on Twitter very recently about the cold shoulder Tesla and SpaceX and stuff has, has experienced and the broader economic and political climate. Do you want to share more about how and how that's been affecting Which things? This question. I got how you see that changing as Tesla expands in the Great Lone Star State? Sure. And those that follow closely are aware of it. I think you probably are aware of it. So somewhat of a rhetorical question, I suspect. But the I think the general public is not aware of the degree to which the unions control the Democratic Party. This is one does not need to speculate on this point. Last year, President Biden held an EV summit where Tesla was explicitly not allowed to come, but the UAW was. So now Tesla's made two thirds of all electric vehicles in the United States. So deliberately excluding us from an EV summit at the White House, but including the UAW, that tells you all you need to know. The reality is the UAW would prefer that Tesla was dead or unionized, but not anything but alive and unionized. And there are no fans of sustainable energy. They have for sustainable energy the entire way. So now at Tesla, far from, like Tesla pay, has the highest pay in the auto industry. And moreover, people that work at our Fremont plant have five job offers to work somewhere else. There's negative unemployment in the Bay Area. Try hiring someone in the Bay Area. It's ridiculous. It's negative unemployment. Our challenge is how do we convince people to stay given the many other opportunities that they have, let alone a union. They're like, what, we don't need a union? I've got five other jobs. That's the real reason. It's the complete opposite for what they're characterizing. And the UAW has never been able to get even enough people to do a vote, let alone get to 50%. And California is an extremely pro-union state. There's nothing you can do to stop a union if they want to come in. It's like the California will roll out the red carpet. So then the UAW is, like, is basically forced to engage in dirty tricks and de attempt to demonize the me and anyone else associated with the company. It's like if the company's basically if the company's run by by so, someone who's perceived to be good, then they have trouble unionizing because there's no they're like, he's a good guy, why would he why would you want to unionize that company? So they have to make me evil somehow. And so I, I do not I, I as you can tell, I don't like the UAW because they have run a dirty tricks campaign on me since at least twenty seventeen. Basically the point at which they thought maybe Tesla wasn't going to go bankrupt. Because while they thought Tesla was going to go bankrupt, they, there was no point in dirty tricks. When they thought Tesla might not go bankrupt, that's when the dirty tricks and the sort of smear campaign started. So I'm not a huge fan of them. Now, their attacks did lose a bit of the wind in the sails when the president of the UAW was sent to prison. So that, that, took a little wind out of, that took a little wind out of their sails. And then when the next UAW president, who was supposed to be the person who would clean things up, when he was sent to prison also, that also took some more wind out of their sails. And, but since then, they, they, in, recently, in the last several months, they've back to their old tricks. And they have so much power over the White House that they can exclude Tesla from an EV summit. It's insane. Insane. And just in case the first thing, in case that wasn't enough, then you have President Biden with Mary Barra at a subsequent event congratulating Mary for having led the EV revolution. With this 26 is, EVs in Q4 of last year. Exactly. This is it. In, I, Mary believe, led. I believe it was in the same quarter that GM delivered 26 yes. electric vehicles. That's right. And Tesla delivered 300,000, not 26,000, 26. <laughs> this is not, uh, this is what they, what they said. It's not us saying, oh, you're artificially saying their number is low. No, that's what they put in their earnings report, okay? <laughs> We're just reading it. Yeah. So that's some next level insanity. Yeah. So it's not, it's not like a, a sort of a conspiracy theory. It's just, it's just observe what, if anyone is a remotely impartial observer, just observe the actions. And what other conclusion could you come to? then the current Democratic Party does not support Tesla because it is not unionized.
They would rather Tesla was dead than be alive and non-unionized. And I think the pressure on this will increase over time. So the more Tesla is successful, the more Tesla is an existential threat to the UAW. And so this, the, the more pressure they'll put on the people that they got elected to do harm to Tesla. How's reception been of Tesla moving into Texas? It's been good. The thing about building the factory here that's I think should be noted is that we built the factory here in less time than it would have taken to get the permits in California. So a typical permit permitting time for a greenfield in California is two years. Two years and you're going to get sued by if, 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 you're just going to get sued because you're in California. <laughs> we didn't get any lawsuits here, and we got the factory built in 18 months. It's insane. Yeah. Since seeing the factory come online, I've <laughs> flown here. I'll get people in the airport and be like, oh, do you work at Tesla? They are so excited. That's the general yeah. sentiment I've seen. had a guy while driving down to see Starbase stop me. He's an oil man. But he was like, my goodness, if this is what they're doing with the rockets, their cars have got to be amazing, too. I think it's working for yeah. the people. I'm excited yeah. for the people. It's, I love living in California, but the problem is you cannot get things done. Yeah. So it's like that's what I mean. But I don't, I, this is not. This is simply a description of fact. And ask anyone and anyone who's done a large project in California, uh, how long would it take you to get the approval to proceed and pass CEQA in California for a large project? Oh, two two years, and you're doing well if you do it in two years. And you're going to get a, a ton of people is going to sue you just for the hell of it, basically. And like I said, we got this built in 18 months less time than it would take, take to get the permit done in California. And when you go back to the fundamental good of Tesla is to what degree are we accelerating sustainable energy, mm -hmm. it matters if we get it done now or in two years. That explains a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, and think, yeah. So we therefore have a choice. Do we get a factory in California and delay progress by two years or yeah. accelerate by two years and do it in Texas? Yeah. What is the, the morally right thing to do? Obviously, Texas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and unless like this, California's gonna need like a crisis to have to have deregulation yeah. and delitigation. It's just the because the the, the the two entities that most control the Democratic Party are the unions and secondarily the plaintiff bar, the lawyers, plaintiff's bar law side. They're basically the lawyers that that sue, especially class action. That's who controls the Democratic Party. Anyone who's familiar with inside baseball of this is will agree with me. This is in fact the case especially in California. So the issue is that the lawyers write the legislation to make it easy to win lawsuits in California because they funded the election of the officials, of the, the, the people that got elected got funded by Democrats and lawyers. So then they write the legislation to make it easy to win lawsuits and get gigantic awards because they got the people elected. And you have this sort of <laughs> circle of not, this nightmarish circle until there has to be an above 0% chance of a Republican getting elected in California. It has to be above 0%. Otherwise, you have a one-party state. Consequences action. Yes, and then the political parties are irrelevant, and it's just the primaries. So that's the situation in California. Is it, unless there's a crisis, I don't see, one possible solution is like more open primaries. Like more open primaries, I think, would reduce the probability of, of special interests manipulating the election. And I, feel, I think like in, in L.A., the, like the mayoral election is open primaries or open primaries. So it looks like maybe Rick Caruso will get elected. And he's, I think it'd be great. And uh, but for the most part, it, it, California is it's gerrymandered to hell and gone and to ensure a majority Democrat outcome. I have a follow-up question. Generally speaking, everything you do is for humanity. Why? Why are we working? Why do you care about the politics? Why do you care about multiplanetary species? Consciousness, you mentioned that. Okay. Yeah. Do you ever get, feel like that's maybe not the case or not true? I mean, there's certainly at times when I have these things. I think that's a good question you ask because it goes to, what it, at a foundational level, what is my philosophy? And why does it lead to this conclusion? Yes. So the reason is that when I was a teenager, I had like an existential crisis to try to figure out what's the meaning of life. There doesn't seem to be any meaning. For me, at least, the religious texts, and I read all of them that I get my hands on, did not seem convincing. So then I'm like, okay. Then I started reading the philosophers. I'd be careful of reading German philosophers as a teenager. I'm definitely not going to help with your <laughs> depression. <laughs> so reading Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, I'm like, Ugh. Now, as an adult, it's much more manageable. But as a kid, you're like, whoa. So then I was like, man, I'm just like struggling to find meaning in life here. And then I read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And basically what Douglas Adams was saying is that we don't really know what the right questions are to ask. Like the question is not, what's the meaning of life? In the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, in the, 
Earth, Earth, it turns out, is a big computer. That's its goal is to answer the question, "What's the meaning of life?" And Earth comes up with the answer forty-two. This is where the forty-two number comes from. And four twenty is just ten times forty-two. <laughs> yeah. So what? So the in in that book, where the, which is really a book about. It's an existential philosophy book disguised as humor. They come to the conclusion that, no, the real problem is trying to formulate the question. And to really have the right question, you need a much bigger computer than Earth. And so maybe one way, of, I think, way of characterizing this would be to say the, <clears throat> the universe is the answer. What is the question? And the more, or what are the questions? The more we can expand the scope and scale of consciousness, the better we can understand what questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. And the, the more we can expand consciousness and become a multi planet species, ultimately a multi cellar species, we have a chance of figuring out what the hell's going on. And, and this is why I think we should have more humans and more digital, both biological and digital consciousness, and why we should become a multi planet species and a multi cellar species, is so that we can understand the nature of the universe. And then, in, in order for that to occur, then we have to make sure that things are good on Earth. We don't want Earth to, to disappear. So, sustainable energy is important for ensuring the long-term viability of Earth. And making life multiplanetary is important for extending consciousness. And ultimately, we want to go and visit other star systems to see if there are alien civilizations there that perhaps still exist or perhaps died out millions of years ago. The extraordinarily short and people, I think, don't realize just how short civilization how, how is. So the first writings were only about 5,000 years ago. So I don't know what happened around 5,000 years ago, but for whatever reason, there's not really writings before that. So not, not some, there's not like some coherent symbolic representation before about 5,000, maybe 5,500 years ago. So you can call, like, if you date civilization from the point at which we had writing, it's only 5,000 years old. Earth has been around for, I don't know, four and a half billion years, five billion-ish. The universe has been around for 13.8 billion years. There were like shellfish, basically, 500 million years ago. So basically, what I'm saying is civilization has existed for an instant. From a, from a sort of a galactic time scale frame of reference, civilization at 5,000 years is, is basically flash in the pan. And if you look at the history of civilizations, which I encourage people to read the history of civilizations. In fact, there's literally a book called The, Hist the Story of Civilization. It's quite good. And there's been the rise and fall of many civilizations over the last 5,000 years. And if you look at, say, the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian civilization, which is one of the first writings, not the first, but, the, but close to the first. They built these incredible pyramids and had this sophisticated writing system. And then the people living in the area past a certain point, I don't know, maybe around 1,500 years ago, the last person who could read hieroglyphics died. I think so, probably 1,500 to almost 2,000 years ago. That's the, the, uh, and, the, and well before that, the last people who could build pyramids died. And then basically people were living next to these structures with, that there was, they just didn't know where they came from, and with funny symbols written on them. And it took, like, Napoleon invading Egypt and bringing a bunch of scholars with him, and then the Rosetta Stone, but much more than the Rosetta Stone, ultimately to decipher hieroglyphics. It's quite a difficult thing to decipher. So, I'm just saying, like, that's a civilization that had a really good run. The, the ancient Egyptians had a 2,500 year run ish. That's a very long time, like 10 times longer than the United States has been a country. But still, they died out. The ancient Sumerians died out. They were arguably the first, like from an archaeological standpoint, the first evidence of writing is the ancient Sumerian. Yeah. They even found like school books and stuff, like clay school books with like Great. teachers' corrections and stuff. <laughs> so it's just like basically civilization has existed for a split second is really what it amounts to. I think it's very important that we become a multi-planet species while we can and before technology potentially subsides below the level where it's possible. Like, we're like, we, we, like one of the possible scenarios, and I think possibly even a probable scenario, is that our tech level actually drops, just like the ancient Egyptians, just like every civilization which has gone through, has gone on a sine wave.
but ultimately a downward sloping sine wave. Just the Egyptians living in Egypt forgot how to build pyramids and read hieroglyphics. We may forget to, how to build spaceships. And so we should build the spaceships and make life multiplanetary while it is possible. And if there were to be a World War Three, which is not zero probability, <laughs> looking at recent events, yeah. what will be left after that? Will there even be, will there be, who's to say what technology would be left after a World War Three situation? Yeah. It should be noted that Russia still has enough nukes pointed at the United States to make every major city, to make the radioactive rubble bounce several times in every major American city currently. It's not a small number. Several thousand. You've seen Battlestar Galactica, I presume, right? Yeah. Do you think, that's, do you think this has all happened before? <laughs> no. Not on Earth, anyway. Archaeologists are really trying hard to find anything interesting. So if you found evidence of an advanced alien civilization, you'd be like the number one hero in the entire archaeological profession. It's like they're trying very hard to find these things. We don't find anything. And people sometimes ask me, have I seen evidence of aliens? I'm like, I have not. And frankly, if I had seen ev evidence of aliens, I'd be like, hey guys, we found ev evidence of aliens. Everyone give SpaceX lots more money because we, we need to improve our rocket technology. Otherwise, these aliens are going to get us. <laughs> uh, I thought you were the alien. <laughs> yeah. I was an alien until I got U.S. citizenship. <laughs> but listen, alien registration card, it said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think fun's rocket development like a war. So. Yeah, if it was exactly. Aliens. Yeah, totally. And if the DOD had evidence of aliens, that would immediately trot them out and say, Danger, aliens, give us more money. <laughs> All your money. Yeah, and everybody like, absolutely, that's not, that's, these aliens may not be friendly. So, best of my knowledge, there's no evidence of aliens. But anyway, like, going back to the philosophy part, it's like, if you accept as a proposition that we don't really understand the meaning of life, and we wish to understand the meaning of life, then in order to understand the meaning of life, we should expand consciousness such that we can ask better questions, learn more, expand beyond the solar system, ensure that life on Earth is good for, for collectively for civilization, and and then we can be less dumb about the nature of the universe, and maybe we can answer some questions about how, where this all came from and where it's going. I think that's a sound philosophy. It's the least unsound philosophy I can think of. <laughs>